Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Plain Speaking, the voice of the only party in this world that cares about you, the Democratic Party. I'm the moderator of this show, and my name is Frank Rosenhoover, and I have our stellar panel here today. We have a plethora of topics, and I want to quickly introduce them again so we can get right down to the nub of why we're here. To my immediate far, far right is George Thompson, our treasurer and resident researcher. And to my far left is Tom Patterson, a very dedicated and interested and committee person. Yeah. <laughs> and to his immediate right and my immediate left is Jillian Kratzer, who, by the way, is our uh, webmaster and Facebook master. And between she and uh, between her and Tom, they are able to move our shows up into the uh, YouTube arena, so you have a lot of reasons and ways to get a hold of us. To my immediate right is Marsha Hunter, who has been very gracious in helping us out both on the show and as a member of the Democratic Committee. So, the big news is, can we win elections in Pennsylvania? We're not going to win them in Blair County, I'm sorry to say. But we have 27,000 Democrats. Everybody know that? 27,000 registered, 27, registered Democrats. And how many voted in the last general election? 12%. Does that tell us we care? <laughs> but we don't have any candidates except at the state level. And we have a, young, a woman who's running against our resident plutocrat, Bill Schuster in the 9th Congressional District. So we're going to start with the governor's race. We have six candidates who have successfully yes, garnered the number of signatures on their petitions in order to qualify them to be on the ballot. And I want to quickly just mention them and ask the panel if they have some comments to make about any one of them so that we can, we, we can't give you a, an in-depth analysis of each candidate because we don't have the time and we will give you their names and I'll give you a very brief idea of who they are and where they are. Rob McCord is the, currently the state treasurer. He's running. Tom Wolf is a successful furniture maker, business person who also was the former revenue secretary under Governor Randell. Allison Schwartz is a member of the United States Congress from the Philadelphia area. Katie McGinty is a former Environmental Protection Agency secretary. And John Hanger is also a former uh, EPA secretary. And Jack Wagner is the former Auditor General. Now, with those six names before us, any commentary from the panel as to what it, we could do to perhaps enlighten our audience as to whom they might want to vote for because, you know, to find out something about all six of them is rather a daunting task, except we can tell you get on the Internet. Every yes. one of them has a website. They do. So, panel, any, any commentary? Well, I, I can say there's a Harper poll that was taken. From Hang on. Har oh, a Harper, Harper, a Harper okay. poll. Uh, yeah, a Harper poll. Yes. Uh, and this is about uh, the governor candidates. It's about other things, too. But yeah. one of the striking things that I see in this poll is uh, the people don't know what the candidates stand for. Uh, John Hanger, Rob McCord, Katie McGinney, they, they're all sitting at 71% of the people that were polled don't really know enough about them. They, in other words, they responded, they're unsure whether they like right. uh, them. The only one who had uh, sort of like a low they don't know about is Tom Wolf. And Tom Wolf, 35% uh, of the people polled said, you know, they don't know really a lot about him. But out of the remain, <coughs> remaining people uh, in that poll, 58% found him favorable, and he was the highest uh, favorable rating He does. Among He's all also the um, been polled the highest against Corbett, and and yeah, you're right, it's the highest name value. Uh, I think probably largely in part because he's put out a lot of ads. Commercial uh, on TV, he is, yes. He's had a really effective marketing campaign. I mean, literally last night, if you Google Allison, I Googled Allison Schwartz for governor, first link that I got, Tom Wolf for governor. I mean, yeah. he knows what he's doing. Well, he and you know, 
he he did come out of the shoot early on, on the he PR p- part of it. Yeah. George, in deference to what you were saying about the, the Harper poll, Pew, which is a very famous and credible uh, survey group, came out about a year or so ago after having surveyed a humongous number of voters and their conclusion that they drew from the interviews they did is that 70 percent of the people who vote don't know the issues and most of them don't even know who the candidates are and particularly when we have six of them now so the problem we have as as uh, wonks in, in, <laughs> in, in our party is to get people interested in voting even if they don't know enough about all of these people because you want to make sure you vote in your own mind who's the most qualified and the only way to find that out is to get into their websites or go to a function where these people come to speak now most of us know that Blair County will never be blue in fact, well, the only blue is we're blue because we're so red. <laughs> and the thing is, these candidates are not breaking down our doors to come here because they know we, you know, our vote is not that important. Although they should be here just to make an appearance. Well, you were saying there's twenty-seven thousand, twenty-seven thousand registered, registered Democrats in Blair County. Well, what I would like to encourage them to do is do exactly what I did yesterday because I'll be honest with you I didn't know very much about any of these people and it took me about a half hour is all it took me and I googled these candidates and I got a real feel for where they are on the issues and what their background was and things of that nature I haven't decided yet who I'm voting for but I think it's very important for all the Democrats in Blair County to vote and all the Democrats to look at the different for example, John Hanger, uh, for, formerly in the EPA, he's big on legalization of medical marijuana. That's one of his key issues. Okay, Rob McCord, um, he has a he hit one of his main issues that he really emphasizes on his website is he's definitely going to expand Medicaid and take the money from the federal government to help give more Pennsylvanians insurance. And he's against tax breaks for big business. He's for training programs for displaced workers. Very, very big on agriculture and tourism, which are two of the major industries in Pennsylvania, trying to prop them up, do as much as he can for economic development in that area. Restore a billion dollars of Corbett's tax cuts to education. Um, Raise the minimum wage is another one of his key issues on all his websites to at least 1070 an hour. And to do oversight on the uh, gas drilling and to take taxes from Marcella Shale. So that's Rob McCord. Kathleen McGinney is an environmentalist, so if you're really into environmental issues, you might want to really look at her website. Uh, Allison Schwartz, as you said, a, f- a, f- a, for- a present con- congresswoman. When she was state senator, she was very um, instrumental in, in putting the CHIP program into place, and she's very big on women's issues and not interfering with women's lives and by the federal government and, and the state government and that kind of a thing. Jack Wagner is pro-life candidate. He's a veteran of the Marine Corps, he's Purple Heart in Vietnam, former state senator, chairman of the Democratic Committee, was on Pittsburgh City Council. And Tom Wolf is uh, has his PhD from MIT, and he's a he's a businessman. So there there's a lot of differences between these candidates, and depending on what issues are important to you, you should look at the uh, at the websites and figure out who you want to vote for. But by all means, vote because this is your primary, and even though we're a small number in rural Pennsylvania. Your voice can be heard it as far as the whole who, statewide total. Exactly, <laughs> and your voice uh, can eventually be well, heard yeah. in the governor's okay. race. George, we'll get to you in a minute, but Jillian uh, is in, uh, kicking sorry. my leg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, just uh, about Hanger for for a, a short second. I, I know the the media has really latched on to his positions on marijuana legalization, but I think one of his bigger platforms medical is marijuana. Medical marijuana, right. yes, um, which is a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. It, it is indeed. Um, which, uh, actually, a, a recent Quinnipiac poll showed that 84% of Pennsylvanians were in favor of uh, medical marijuana. 
Right. Uh, but uh, his a bigger platform of his is actually uh, public education, which, uh, in fairness, a lot of the different candidates are very, very strong on public education. Um, Tom Wolf, for example, uh, would like to expand public education to include universal pre-K, <coughs> which mm -hmm. I think would be fantastic. And, you know, I, I was er erroneous when I said these candidates don't come to Blair County. Uh, John Hang has been here twice. Yes, he and has. Very uh, early Lord, in the race. And, yeah, well, <laughs> Tom Rob Wolf mm -hmm. uh, has been here once. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that uh, uh, others are coming. Uh, I've been in contact with a couple of the campaigns. And as soon as we can nail a uh, date on their schedule, I will announce it. And I don't want to be premature. But uh, it is so important that, you know, we get to see and hear these people. And uh, I don't know how much information people want. But one of the things we're going to do as a committee is between now and May is to is really, truly try to get out there and, and encourage people to vote. Because even though we don't have candidates here, uh, we do have an impact statewide. And that's how... Uh, Scott Conklin became the lieutenant governor candidate back when in 2010 w because he was uh, facing a guy by the name of Seidel from Philadelphia. But we turned out the votes in the T to the point that he beat Seidel by about 1% of the total votes. So we can do it if we understand that every vote counts in the statewide race, and that's what it's all about. And of course, what you're talking about when you refer to the T is rural, you know, the middle of Pennsylvania up to the edges. You sort of have Pittsburgh over here and Philly over here and Erie up there, but it's the rest of the state. Yeah, and right. that's that's right, and that's important to get them out. George, do you have a comment well, on this, Governor? you know, Marcia said there's differences among the gubernatorial candidates in the Democratic primary, but there's also, I'd say, similarities. Yes. I mean, they all uh, support taxing the Marcella Shale gas uh, more than Governor Corbett has done. In fact, <laughs> his extraction tax doesn't exist. The only and thing I, he extracted was zero? money for his campaign. And exactly. They were heavy contributors uh, uh, to Governor Corbett's campaign. I'm sure they'll be this year, yeah. too. Uh, but in any case, that's a similarity. Uh, there's a lot of criticism with Governor Corbett's reduction in the Department of Education funding and all of the Democratic candidates I think it's fair to yeah. say yeah. Mm -hmm. support increased right. uh, funding yeah. uh, like I said they support taxing the Marcellus Shale that's another uh, I think they similarity. all support uh, the Medicaid uh, have the, the uh, state taking the Medicare all of money them, yeah. right all yeah. of them support the Medicaid expansion because we lose up to a billion dollars a year it's, it's between 750 million and a billion that we are we can get from the government for nothing right and it's really unfortunate how that has gone we've talked several times about the negative uh, attitude people have towards Obamacare totally unjustified in fact I would contend most people really don't know what Obamacare offers especially locally because there's no conversation and we have no office here either Oh, no. There's, if you want to talk, uh, if you want to go to an office and talk to someone, you have to go to either Huntington, Center County, or uh, okay. Cambria County. Cambria County yeah. You know, there's no information unless you want to get on an 800 right. number. Tom, you have any comments on the governor's well, Yeah, it's, uh, it comes down to the fact that people see what they want to see. Yeah, you know, we all spend time researching. We get online, look up candidates, look up the issues. Most of the people look at a TV ad or a radio ad. They see Tom Wolf and McGinney, and they say, well, gee, I saw them on TV. I, I, I like them. Yeah, but do they know what they stand for? No, people need to start looking at each candidate and make up their mind from there. Mm -hmm. Just because somebody does a nice flashy ad, that doesn't mean they're a good person. Well, and well, trust me, this election season, with Schuster and the rest of them, there's going to be a lot of ads. Well, yeah. well, that, well, that's what I was yeah. going to say. Uh, Bill Schuster certainly is hitting the airwaves uh, with the yeah, ads. Because he's one of scared because he hasn't done that before. And I think he sees the handwriting on the wall that people are sick and tired of being uh, misrepresented uh, and I'm talking about the majority of our people. I think he represents a very small, he's like a little one of one percent representatives. Yeah, I mean, if you saw his uh, three minute getting to know you ad, uh, <laughs> you will know that he voted 42 times at the filming of the ad to repeal Obamacare. So, 
Yeah, he's voted to keep uh, the most uh, expensive health care system the world has. Yes. He's voting to keep that. He's also voting to keep a health care system that although it costs double what most countries' health care costs uh, per person, yeah. that also has less than stellar results. That's right. We are. Very- and so just so people understand, and I think it's so important to keep saying that because people don't know that. If you listen to the candidates uh, on the Republican side, well, they want to keep the best uh, health care system in the well, world. It is not. That money can buy. That money, that money can buy. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> if you have money, yes. and lots of it, we have one of the best health care systems in the world. But if you're just a middle class person, no, we do not. And you know, how can we get the folks who work for a living, who are not making fifty, seventy, eighty, ninety, hundred thousand dollars a year, and many of them who are making fifteen to twenty to twenty five thousand who need Medicaid, how can we convince them? How help us? How can you convince the people you know? that voting for these Republicans, like Bill, Bob, Bill Schuster and Tom Corbett, all you're doing is denying the average American, Pennsylvania citizen the benefits of education and health care. How, how can we make people understand that? Oh, well, they have to take the initiative, like Tom yeah. said. I, I mean, they have to pay a little bit of attention to what's going yeah, on. Yeah, well, there are two <laughs> ideologies that I think are ingrained in people's minds that all politicians are crooks and my vote don't count. And those are two things that need to be turned around. Debunked, yeah. The Democrats can do some good if they get that thought out of their head and go into the polls. You know, well, and I think an important point <coughs> is that the media also really encourages you to identify not with, you know, people that are downtrodden and working for minimum wage, but with people like Mitt Romney, because this is America, and someday uh, yeah. you can Big be success, rich, too. Yeah. But you know what? That is just not the case anymore. It's a big, fat lie. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. Well, you see, that's the whole thing. And I and like uh, Tom said, you know, that idea that, you know, our vote doesn't count and they're all crooks. Well, if that's your idea, you're going to get more Corbett's and more Schuster's, and they're going to be for there forever. We've got to take a look at what have they done for me, and I don't know how we do that. And, and it's like I always say, it's about economic interest. Yes. Politics is not about social issues. You want to talk about social issues, there's a different forum for that. Politics is about how is the pie distributed. And we're, we're going to get into in income inequality yeah. later, but in our country, we have worse income inequality right now in our country than some of developing nations. Mm-hmm. It is getting ridiculous <coughs> because people are not voting for their best economic interests. And I don't know how you communicate that when there's all this propaganda in the airways that you should vote for a candidate based on a social issue, not on what's best for your family economically. It's just like abortion and gun control and things like that. What impact do they have on your job? None. None None whatsoever. Well, but I think it's important to note that the Republicans, you know, have framed issues like abortion as social issues. But for many, many, many women, these are economic issues. Yeah, because... You know, the when you have children, uh, it, you know, determines the amount of money that you're going to make in your life. That's right. And many people sacrifice in that respect. Now, before we go to our first break, I'm we're pro- approaching that, but I want to <laughs> I want to mention that... Uh, as far as candidates are concerned, and I mentioned earlier in the show that, unfortunately, because of our history of being able to win races, we don't have a candidate opposing John McGinnis in the 79th. We don't have somebody who's seeking the seat that Jerry Stern is leaving in the 80th. And we are fortunate, however, to have a woman who is running against Bill Schuster, and the woman's name is Elena, A-L-A-N-A, Hartzok, H-A-R-T-Z-O-K, and she will be on the Democratic ballot. Mm-hmm. She got enough petitions, uh, enough signatures on her petition, so we have a Democratic candidate. Now, there's no question she's going to win the nomination for the Democrats because she's the only name on the ballot. So we have got to tell our people here, even though there are no local Democratic candidates in these positions, as Marcia said, and I tried to re- reinforce, every Democratic vote in 
Blair County goes toward the statewide races and Elena Hartzog's race, and it will give them a better shot to win. And I want to quickly mention some dates, and then we'll go to our first break. For everybody, just so you know, that the, the last day to register, of course, is over, and the last day of March, May 13th is over, really, so we have until... Uh, the last day to circulate petitions, well, that's, that's there. That's the last day to register to vote is April 21st. Yeah, okay, April 21st is the last day to register, and the last day to apply for an absentee ballot is May 13th. So if you haven't registered and you're interested in stopping this tide of Republican ruin, you want, might want to register as a Democrat and vote, and April 21 is the last day to do that. And if you can't, for whatever reason, get to the polls on the 20th of May, you ought to get an absentee ballot, and the last day to apply is the 13th of May. So let's take our first break, and when we come back, we'll take a look at some other issues. Oh, we have to hit the lieutenant governors, too. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Overlooking the city of Altoona, the Booker T. Washington Park had lost its luster. With that in mind, Operation Our Town and the Central Blair Recreation and Park Commission, in collaboration with the NAACP, set out to give back to the community. Um, the court was in bad shape. It needed some new backboards, rims. There was cracks. Um, there was grass growing up onto the court itself. New additions to the park will include a renovated basketball court, playground for families and friends, fitness stations, and a walking path. I can't wait till everything is done so I can bring my grandkid to play in the playground. Kids can use it for, you know, for whatever their imagination brings them. Members of the community already have noticed a difference. Stuff for the kid to do to keep him out of trouble. Strange to me. Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are now taking, going to take a quick look at our lieutenant governor candidates, and uh, there are six of them who are certified. They had the s enough signatures on their petitions to qualify for being placed on the ballot, and they are in no particular order, and I'll start from the bottom of my list up. There's a gentleman by the name of Mark Smith, who happens to be a county commissioner in the county of Bradford. There is a fellow who is a member of the Pennsylvania General Assembly by the name of Brandon Newman. And there is a gentleman by the name of Mike Stack who happens to be a senator in this Pennsylvania uh, Senate. And there is a gentleman by the name of Mark Critz who was at, for a long time an aide to uh, John Murtha and who then won a one term to replace jo Jack at the U.S. Congress in the 12th. And then the last person uh, is Jay Paterno, who many of you know by reputation and his uh, most important part of what he's success about was he was a coach for Penn State for many, many years. And Brad Kaplinski. Yeah, and do I have Brad? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I missed him. Thank you very much. Brad Kaplinski, yes, who's a Harrisburg City Council uh, person. And uh, those are the six people. And commentary on these people because we're, the table's open for well, any well, commentary. Well, I, I can refer to, to the Harper poll that I quoted for the okay, governor's uh, race. Uh, they also polled people for the lieutenant governor's race. And uh, Jay Paterno actually was the top vote getter. Uh, among the people in that poll, uh, he uh, slightly uh, received more votes than Mark Kritz, who was the second highest uh, vote getter uh, in the poll. But I might caution here again, 48% of the people polled uh, said that they were undecided, which you can interpret as they don't know anything about any of right. the candidates. And so it, uh, the, the poll was based on you know, really a lack of information about what each of these uh, people stand for. Now, we've actually had some of the uh, candidates. Uh, yeah, we've had Kopensky and Kritz and Paterno here in Blair County already. So, yes. Com other commentary of any kind? Well, probably that poll was primarily on name recognition. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Statewide already, there's name recognition on Jay Paterno and Mark Kritz. So, once again, if you just go online and really look into what these people are are interested in doing, 
you have a better chance of, of voting for the person that's going to represent you best rather than just voting yeah. on And unfortunately, in, in, in races poll. where there are multiple candidates, the, the name recognition does have a great play because sure. most people by nature don't want to take the time and effort to get into the websites and read about each of these characters. Characters, candidates. <laughs> <laughs> well, each of these characters. Well, yeah. well <laughs> there, there also could have been an additional candidate, uh, Brenda Alton. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and this is interesting. Uh, she, you need signatures to be listed on the ballot. Yeah. And unfortunately for her, she sent an aide with all of her signatures uh, to register with the Department of State, like, I don't know, five minutes she before five o'clock. She was there. She was there already at the building, and uh, her aide was um, waylaid, I guess you could say, well, by, a by a security officer. He was stopped by a security <laughs> officer, and the petitions were turned in at, I'm not even kidding, 5.01. So she's challenging the state's decision there because if he had not been stopped, she would have gotten the petitions in in time. Okay. Any other commentary on the lieutenant governors? Now, well, so the, the progressive Democrats uh, had uh, – the, even the Democratic Party has different uh, philosophies, and uh, there's a group, the progressive Democrats, and they had all of the uh, lieutenant governor candidates make their presentations, and uh, they actually uh, – <laughs> found Kaplinsky <coughs> as the top uh, person in their minds. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, but, you know, this this will be coming out in the next month or so as P as the candidates yeah. reveal what they stand for. Okay. Mm -hmm. As we were discussing earlier, uh, Lieutenant Governor, if you ask a lot of people on the street who our Lieutenant Governor is, most of them don't know. Yeah, you know, that's the thing, you know, and they uh, play a vital role just as much as the Governor. Yeah. And that's a sad problem. You know, people look at these lists and well, they could care less about the lieutenant governor, but it matters. You know, they're their thoughts and actions because they are on committees. You know, they chair, like you said, they chair the National Guard. And, you know, people just, they don't realize that they're just not a, a face in the background in case anything happens to the governor. There was one comment that was made earlier in our off-camera discussion that, that uh, there was one candidate who is, who is currently serving in a public office and running for a new office, but that's allowable under state law in Pennsylvania. You can be a current member of the General Assembly and run for the Senate or run for uh, the Congress or run for governor or something else, and you can, main, you can run for them both. Well, actually, uh, Senator Jubilee, he did that. He, he mm -hmm. served, I think, both capacities yeah. simultaneously. He was lieutenant governor when... Uh, uh, Schweiker, let's see, Schweiker, no, uh, Ridge went to, and then Schweiker became governor, and then right, the speaker. Well, Ridge went to Washington. Yeah, Ridge yeah. went to Washington. But Scott Conklin, when he ran for lieutenant governor, he ran for re-election as a state house member, too. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a candidate, one of the candidates on the uh, the ballot who, uh, and the guy's name is Newman. I mean, he is a, he is a Congress, he is a representative now of the General Assembly, but... Uh, but again, that is permissible. <clears throat> it seems kind of unfair sometimes that you really have nothing, a heck of a lot to lose because now the prestige of lieutenant governor, I think, is probably a little more important than sure. one of the 100 and, or 205 representatives. A uh, he's a, actually a state that senator, that number, I, I might add. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wonder how far that will get. <clears throat> okay. And one other thing about voting in, in May. Now, there, the petitions for county Democratic Committee uh, had to be turned in uh, this past Tuesday. Yes. And some of us sitting here had have done that, and all five of us, I'm sure, have put our petitions in. And so the, the Blair County Democratic Committee is made up theoretically or actually of two representatives from each of the 97 precincts. So conceivably that committee could be 194 strong. Now, I don't think we've ever had more than 70 or 80 at any one meeting. And so we encourage the folks out there, and this is by precinct, though. You, only the people who vote like I'm in 14-2, so only the people who live in 14-2 can vote for me as a member of the state uh, the committee uh, at the Blair County level. And so, it, if you, and by the way, if you want to run, uh, write your name in. Because uh, even though the, the petitions had to be in with a minimum of 10 signatures, 
If you feel strongly about it, get a few of your friends and neighbors to put your name in and run. Now, there are two of us who are running for state committee, and Robin Arndt, who is now currently on the state committee, and myself, we're both running for a four-year term. So you'll see my name on the ballot twice, <laughs> and don't think you voted once and you, both of them are taken care of, you know. <laughs> so that, keep that in mind, because the, the county committee is a very important uh, committee because it actually sets the standard for how the Democratic Party is going to succeed in Blair County. Okay, moving right along. We talked a little bit the other day, we just briefly mentioned the Pennsylvania Right to Work Bill, and I want to make a, a couple very brief comments about the fallacies that are being spread about that bill. Number one, that bill only applies to public sector employees. And one of the premises of that bill will forbid governmental entities from withholding from employee employees the amount of money that they owe for the union for their dues. Now, the lies, and they are blatant lies that are being spread, is that union money, union dues, is being used for political purposes. That has always been illegal. And there is not a penny of union dues that is used for political purposes. Now, all local, most unions have, like most businesses have, mm -hmm. a political action committee, like the Chamber of Commerce and Exxon and, and uh, New Enterprise Stone and Lime and all and these the companies. And the Tea Party. And the Tea Party. Absolutely. And so they collect money, and that money is voluntarily given, and everybody doesn't give who belongs to a union. There are many unions who have only maybe 10% of the people who give money toward a PAC. So when you are looking at that right to work, it's really not a right to work law, it's a right to screw public employees out of union activity because if they can't have their dues withheld from their paychecks on a regular basis, like they do in the private sector, then the unions will have a great difficulty in surviving. So don't think for one moment that that right to work law is anything more than an attempt to destroy public sector unions. I think if you look at the people that are sponsoring these bills, it says a lot about what's in them. I mean, if you look at the, the state senate version of the bill uh, on the list of co-sponsors, uh, are names like Mike Terzai, who famously declared that voter ID laws would help the GOP win Pennsylvania. Um, Jim Christiana of Beaver County, who was recently with us uh, in a town hall meeting. Uh, our very own John McGinnis is a co-sponsor on this bill. The perennial uber conservative Daryl Metcalf. And, uh, you know, uh, on this... And, oh, excuse me, I almost forgot. John Eichelberger. Oh, I was going to say, how could you forget yeah. him? How could I forget John Eichelberger <laughs> is the uh, primary sponsor and, uh, in, in the, the Senate. Senate version. Yeah. And the, he's going around. These guys are lying. Folks, they are lying. Those are bold-faced lies. Public sector employees, union dues are not spent for political purposes. And I challenge these people. McGinnis and, and Eichelberg and the rest of these characters, and I can use that term now, <laughs> the rest of these characters, I mean, they are absolutely distorting the truth. And that's a bold faith. They're no wonder people say they're all crooks. When you lie about the content of a bill, to me, that's a violation. Well, well, they don't really refer to it anyway as right to work. Uh, there are right to work. Uh, provisions, uh, suggested legislation, but they refer to it as paycheck protection. Uh, yeah. and, and the idea is that somehow they're out there fighting for every employee's right to keep the money that they uh, earn. And how dare, you know, they deduct that from your uh, union dues from and, your and, pay. And, well, and, and, uh, yeah. and so it's, it's an argument that really addresses what you're saying. They're trying to get to right to work, uh, uh, and, but they don't exactly present it that way. And the thing about it is, there is no prohibition from any worker in the in the public sector from not joining a union. We don't have closed shop. No. There is not a. There, there's no 
stat there was no statute there was no provision in government that says if you are a teacher and PSEA is a teacher union that you got to belong you don't have to do that the only place in this area that used to have that was the railroad mm -hmm. years ago you had to be a union member or you couldn't go to work for the railroad that's called a closed shop we don't have that and so with these legislators are going around saying that these public employees are being forced to join unions they're not it's all voluntary any other commentary before I go nuts? well and this is the whole this is the whole demise of living wages in the middle class okay let's is to segue into state that by state get rid of unions do everything they can do to weaken unions because we, unions provide collective bargaining for workers and with collective bargaining with workers, you have a chance by bonding with your fellow employees to have a united front with management to try to get a decent living wage for working where you're working. And decent and, working conditions. And, de and decent working conditions. <clears throat> and management and these representatives that you so nicely, you know, went off McGinnis, mm -hmm. Eichelberger, the whole lot of them, they're interested in saving, you know, the state as much money as they can by getting to the point where people that are working in the public sector make nothing. And they already make nothing vis-a-vis -vis somebody that's working as a CEO for a bank or some of these exorbitant salaries in the private sector, but nobody worries about the exorbitant salaries of the private sector. People care about a teacher making enough money to feed his or her children. Mm -hmm. That's what they complain about. Well, they also blame the unions for having uh, an effect on jobs coming into Pennsylvania. They've you know, locally here cited different times. Uh, if we were simply uh, a right-to-work state, that somehow magically our economy would prosper. And you know, there's no evidence uh, if you go into research to back up this In claim. fact, if you ever watch Ed Schultz uh, on MSNBC, he has charts that has that show definitely that the research in this country shows that in the right to work states versus those states that don't have those kind of laws, the the workforce uh, income and benefits is so much higher and the production is so much higher because people are happier when they're making good money and getting good benefits and they are not working for an employer who can fire you at will right because without a without a union to there to protect your basic rights of discipline and dismissal you then become an at-will employee which means management needs no reason whatsoever to fire you if they don't like your face on friday you can be and do, 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 gone by monday and, 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 and back to what george was saying this I, I i printed off a bunch of stuff that i got off the internet on income inequality texas which is one of the booming states for jobs they're a non-union right to work state has the one of has the biggest income inequality in the country between rich and poor in and that the state. largest number of people uninsured absolutely that well, too well this argument about unions is soon going to disappear right now only seven percent of the workforce in uh, private industry is, is unionized, unionized. Yeah. right and to keep blaming <coughs> the unions for uh, you know lack of a robust economy is, is going to just disappear the and, 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 and the public sense. sector unions is one of the few places where unions still exist and every state is trying to pass more paycheck protection right to work legislation to get back to get to get rid of the last bastion of unionization which is public sector employees yeah. I, I mentioned this before and I'm gonna say it again because I think it's the most heinous example of how the Republicans don't care for the working person when I was in California in 2010 the Republican Governors Association was meeting there and their number one priority, as it was printed in the Los Angeles Times, was the total destruction of public sector unions. And right away, Scott Walker went back, Snyder went back in Michigan, Kasich in Ohio, Scott in Florida, now Corbin in Pennsylvania. They're jumping on this. And why are they trying to deny public sector employees the right to bargain and make good wages? 
Well, and Why? I and I want to bring up one more thing. You, you brought up Scott Walker in Wisconsin. I'll, you talk about people voting against their economic interests. There was a lot of teachers, a lot of firemen, a lot of policemen in Wisconsin that voted for Scott Walker, a Republican governor. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when he started taking away their rights, they all sat down in the Capitol and demonstrated. It was too late. They voted for the wrong guy right. because they didn't vote for their own economic interests. And that should be an example for those of you who are watching. If you care about protecting the economic advantage that public sector employees have, don't vote for the Republicans because they are all in mass supporting this bill of destroying public sector. So no teacher, no worker for the state government, no worker for the county government, no worker for the city government, in all conscience should be thinking of voting Republican this time. And a lot of them are. And they're going in to this vote. area, in this county, and why? a lot of them are. I say why. No. And it is my understanding also, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the public sector workers also includes unions in the uh, non-profit arena. Yes. Anybody so. whose money is derived from in any fashion from the, the, the government and many uh, like the United Ways and people like that, you know, maybe not United Way, but there are agencies that work yeah. for people that get a substantial amount of money from the government and therefore they, they would qualify as well. It's, and uh, we're about ready to take our second break. Is there, is there any, well, we'll come back and touch this inequality thing when mm -hmm. we come back from our break because it is so important. We, we, we can't stand back and let the Republican Party destroy the working class. Well, well, you know, we're talking about salaries, perhaps, or French benefits. But let, let me just say that this union issue in government is more than that. I, I'm old enough to remember when uh, people were routinely fired from government positions if they belonged to the wrong political party, mm, yeah. whoever was in control. And the only ones protected were civil service people. And if you look at uh, people in employment and government, all sorts of people nowadays are not in covered by civil service. Uh, and so they're really subject to dismissal, except and the well, union yeah. protects them. That's right. And so so it's a little bit even more than just what salary you yeah. earn. It's whether you have a job at all. Yeah. Okay. Let's take our last break, and then we'll be back and finish off the agenda here. Thank you. Operation Our Town is reaching out into our community every day, helping groups like the Gloria Gates Foundation. They received a grant in 2009 from Operation Our Town to help fund their program, which was established more than 10 years ago. We now have um, children who've gone through our program and are out of high school, and they're young adults, and we're, they're coming back and they're telling us the impact our after-school program had on them. So we know that we are reaching the kids. The Gloria Gates Foundation prides itself on teaching the children lessons that will stay with them throughout their life. Operation Our Town, creating community-minded citizens for a better tomorrow. Welcome back to Plain Speaking. Well, you know, it, it seems sad that, that we can identify so, so many problems, so, so many attempts by those that have who want to take away from those who don't have enough to enjoy a decent living anyway. Where is the moral compass in this country today? I, I'm, I'm at my wit's end to understand how these people can profess publicly that they're such good Christian people when yet in their other lives 
are doing everything they can to deny the basic amenities of life. Okay. I don't know if people really understand the serious gap in the United States. I mean, the top a family in the top 1% has a net worth 288 times greater than the typical American family. And that's that that's the biggest income gap ever in the history of our country. Well, since the end of Bush's reign, CEO salaries have what 400 percent going up. Right. I mean, you know, you're looking at people. Well, they just said that you know, GM, yeah, you know, had an off year, but their CEO still got bonus of several hundred million dollars. Yeah, you know, in stock options. Yeah. And it's just you know, people look at that and they just they don't realize you know that they're they're working for you know seven twenty five an hour. And somebody will still go out and vote Republican? And, yeah. and they're, they're coming out and saying that they're going to lose jobs in the public, in the economy if we raise it to $10. And I think that has been debunked over the years. You, you might lose a few jobs, but you, what you're doing is that the greatest number of people are still going to get more money to live a better life. I, well, it's like what he was saying was that because of... CEO salaries, and because of salaries at the top going up so much, they could have everybody working. This is like sort of a yeah. joking way of putting it, but this is true. They could have one less yacht, and everybody could make ten dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. The money has been going to the top and not being <clears throat> shared properly with the workers. It. it the, the number of just to, just to read this a 2011 study by the Congressional Budget Office found that the top earning one percent of households increased their income by 275 percent after federal taxes and income transfers over a period between 1979 and 2007 compared to a gain of just 40 percent for the 60 percent of the middle of America's income distribution. So, in other words, the middle class's wages since 1979 have gone up 40 percent, and the top one percent have gone up 275 percent. That's six times So, the, it's disparate. And, and what it is, is everybody talks about the market, and if you just let the market go and don't have any government interference, it'll take care of itself. This proves that it doesn't take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Unless you have things like a minimum wage, you're not going to force people to pay people what they're worth. Well, and and they've, they've painted it so that you're actually starting class warfare if you bring these yeah. issues up, the, the disparity of income. And, and I would contend that the people that uh, are buying this argument should ask why these uh, wealthy people spend literally millions of dollars lobbying to get laws that protect the wealthy. That's right. I, I mean, that 15% tax uh, on capital gains, that's, un that's, that's, that's lower than, than many it's people right. that, that earn $80,000 uh, pay at the upper And what they're saying is, and there's a lot of statistics to prove this, Many of the millions of people who work for Walmart, for instance, right. don't make enough money to live on. So we're subsidizing them for food stamps and Medicaid and other benefits that if they would make enough money, they wouldn't have to be getting government subsidies. They wouldn't need. And so the, the, when they look at Walmart and they keep theirs at 725 that means we, as citizens of, of the United States, are using monies that are great raised through taxes that could be put to other uses if they would just raise their salaries. Because, I mean, we should be honest, and minimum wage is just another way of saying, if I could pay you less, I would. Right. Good point. And there Good. are those that want to eliminate the minimum wage. Oh, yes. Oh, all right. right. Well, if you follow yeah. the logic, yep. uh, we'll have full employment if yeah. we uh, yeah. reduce the uh, wage right to, to $2 or would something. would like to get rid of the minimum wage. <laughs> sure. The, the, the people think that's a, yeah. a desirable goal? <laughs> to reduce the minimum wage till till we hit the third world country standards. 
Well, and, and in 2012, the gap between the richest 1% and the remaining 99% was the widest since it's been since the 20s. And you got to realize, back in the 20s, there was no minimum wage, there were no child labor laws, there was no OSHA where you could you could work under any kind of you know um, environmental um, conditions that you needed to. People forget these things. People just assume that everything will be go, uh, be okay if we just let the market go the way it's going to go. And when we did that, what happened in 1929? Mm, the Great mm -hmm, Depression. Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay. Now we talked about income inequality, but will we ever be able to get the people who should vote to understand that so they can come out and protect their own interests? Because there is a great disparity in the the people who vote, the people who are in charge today, who make the money, who are enjoying all the benefits of higher wages and so on, on they vote. Yes, they but vote. But the people who really truly, and, and I'm not condemning, but I'm saying, why don't you vote? If you well, listen to the news, you'll see that they want to take more from you. I think that's true, but I think, uh, you know, we have to look at the fact that, uh, you know, voting has been cut back and oh, into yes, this the, one day, you know, and a lot of people, and, and I know legally, and, and a lot of people I think don't know this, but legally you can take off work for the time that it takes you to vote. Your employer has to let you do that. They don't have to pay you. And that's a problem for a lot of people that are only making minimum wage right. and or slightly above even, you know, but there are ways that we could help this. We could expand voting. We could have weekend voting. But now those states but are reducing Republicans it. Republicans don't want that. Absolutely. Yeah. We're reducing it. Well, Pennsylvania, a number of states with the uh, photo ID laws are sort of restricting yeah. voting, but yeah. a number of states are not. Uh, well, they're in doing what you're suggesting. Yeah. Well, you know, Ohio just cut out Sunday voting, and they've been doing this all over the country. Yes. 26 of the states now under total control of the Republican Party. Well, well they, they, lost, the they lost a national election, yeah. and they and don't you, want the people that are mm -hmm. working to vote. That's right. Yeah. Okay, we're getting down to about eight, seven, eight, eight minutes left. Uh, I know we could probably talk forever about the income inequality, but unless the people who are watching us who are interested in stopping the tide that is rolling around this country by those who are in charge to continue to deny and diminish the working people. I don't know how we're going to stop it, folks. You've got to get out there. You've got to vote for a Democratic governor. You've got to vote for Elena Hartzog to replace Bill Schuster. And hopefully when Eichel Berger's term comes up next year, we ought to get people out there to try to take that person out of, the, out of his office. I, I don't know how we can do it. We have to do it at the ballot box. There's no other way to do it, in my simple mind. Well, Any other topics here? Because we... You know, we want to make sure that the panel has every opportunity to put something on the table. Well, well of course, uh, Governor Corbett, he's a, a new candidate uh, now that oh, he's yes. uh, uh, read the that? polls. Mm. And uh, all of a sudden he uh, realizes, well, maybe I won't be a second-term governor. We're doing the so dance in the center now. So <laughs> talk about, uh, you know, things uh, in yeah. income inequality. How dare people get uh, food stamps? when they have assets. So one of the things he did last year is to have an asset test. Uh, right. Basically, if you're laid off and you know you don't have any income, well, if you happen to own a house, that's going to account towards uh, not making you ineligible for, for food stamps. That's absolutely and, and so, uh, But now he's changed. He saw, he's seen the light, and, <laughs> and now he's uh, reversing himself. On that particular but just issue. just for the election, you bet your sweet bottom dollar <laughs> if he would ever, God forbid, get elected again, yeah. they will reinstate that. That's George, right another. Back. Well, as, as a good uh, uh, Catholic, he's also, I guess, following Pope Francis' uh, uh, plea to maybe uh, lower capitalism's uh, uh, effects on people. And, uh, you know, he's also uh, talking about... Uh, 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 a change in the Medicare expansion. He's uh, up to this point been pushing a uh, healthy Pennsylvania, but uh, he now is uh, sort of relaxing the work search requirement in uh, healthy Pennsylvania, and it's uh, 
because perhaps the federal government would not have approved. Oh, no, they've already and said they won't. Approve. So so now he's being forced to change his work requirement, which I might add, uh, you know, I've listened to a number of uh, uh, people uh, talk about this uh, healthy PA and the, how great the uh, work search requirement is. Well, let me just say that many of the people that don't have health care that would have been eligible for healthy PA Medicaid expansion already have jobs. They work full time. Mm -hmm. Their employer does not provide health care uh, to them, and their income actually is so low that they would have been eligible for the Medicaid. So what Governor Corbett has done by not accepting Obamacare as it was passed, he's basically telling these people, we don't care about you. You're on your own. Yeah. Right now, this year, if you go and try to get, si they, they aren't even eligible for subsidized health care. Which is terrible. Be because their income is literally too low. Because this is what the Medicaid expansion was built to do. That's right. It was to pick up the slack and to make sure everybody got care. And that's the whole thing. And I'm going to say the one thing, too, real quickly before Jillian has a comment at the end here. The, Ameri the Affordable Care Act is not going to be the death of the Democratic Party in 2014. Even though we lost that congressional seat down in Florida, that is not the issue. It's the equity issue. It's protecting the rights of American citizens that's going to win the day, and each of you can help us do that. Jillian, you want to tell the folks what we expect of them now? <laughs> <laughs> we expect. Well, please come see us on Facebook. Uh, you can like us on Facebook. If you're on Twitter, you can follow us at Blair Dems. You can find us on YouTube now, thanks to Tom's help. And uh, as always, you can find us at BlairDems.org, where you can find all this information and absolutely more. Okay, so we appreciate your viewing, and panel, thanks very much for your expertise and interest. And we will be back in two weeks. And I have some more, hopefully, interesting commentary and thoughts about how we can reclaim the rights of the American people. Thank you very much.